The U.S. bishops met in Baltimore for their annual fall assembly to address the sex abuse crisis. Why is the Vatican blocking their efforts to take action? Auxiliary Bishop Mark Rivetuso of St. Louis is here with an update. Later, Fox News Channel host and author Tucker Carlson stops by to talk politics and his new book, Ship of Fools. And finally, we'll get story-oriented with Jared Krososka, the National Book Award-nominated author and illustrator of the new graphic novel, Hey Kiddo. The World Over begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. Tucker Carlson, Bishop Mark Rivetuso, and Jarrett Krasowska are all straight ahead. Send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo, and I'll be live tweeting throughout. Joining me now to talk politics and his new bestseller, Ship of Fools, how a selfish ruling class is bringing America to the brink of revolution, is author and host of Tucker Carlson Tonight, the aforementioned Tucker Carlson. <laughs> Raymond Arroyo, Great ladies to have and you here. Good Thank you. you. Um, this book is really, and I, I, I did enjoy it thoroughly. I questioned some of the illustrations, which we're going to get to in a moment, about whether they're all fools, but we'll talk about that later. The book is really about the attack of the elite, both right and left, on middle America, yes. on the people in the middle. How did these two groups, who are so politically disparate, what is fueling their enmeshment at this moment? What's bringing the elites on the right and left together? Well, they have something deeply in common, which is they're all getting richer from the economy as it's organized in mm -hmm. 2018. So if you're in finance, if you're in technology, if you're in politics, a borderless world, globalism makes you richer mm. because it reduces the friction of commerce. Right. And so they have a vested stake in the way the economy is currently uh, organized. Most other people in the country have gotten poorer. This is, a, as a factual matter, the right. middle class is contracted. It's no longer a majority. And so they're dissatisfied. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty simple economic question, really. Mm -hmm. If you're richer than you were after the financial crisis of 2008, you're probably on Hillary Clinton's team. And if you're not, you're probably not on Hillary's team. Mm -hmm. What about the suppression of the middle class? And you talk about it in the book. They, that suppression really birthed Donald Trump. For sure. But the elites didn't get the message. Why not? On the either, in either party. Trump was to wake up the people in charge in both parties. So Paul Ryan, I would say, as well as Nancy Pelosi. Didn't get the call. Didn't right. get the memo. That you're not representing us. That we're very dissatisfied. And nothing you have offered us is sufficient. So the Republicans said, you know what? You're upset. I get it. I've got a Jeb Bush for you. It's going to make everything fine. And Republicans said, there's nothing against Jeb Bush. Like, everyone likes Very Jeb nice Bush. Very nice man. Totally nice guy, mm -hmm. smart guy, thoughtful guy. If he was a godfather of one of my kids, I'd be happy uh, about dad, that. Uh, nothing against him personally. But the program he's selling, yeah. we've already bought before, didn't care for it, didn't work, didn't answer the questions we want answered. We want something else. No, I think you want Jeb Bush. Shh, adults are talking. Mm -hmm. Here's some more Jeb Bush. And they're like, you know what? You're not listening. We're going to hire a large, loud, orange person <laughs> to get your attention. And it didn't work. Yeah. They never got the message. It's no. very weird. And now we hear talk that Hillary Clinton might be stepping forward uh, for a third time to offer her candidacy. Well, so the interesting thing, this is another sign of how out of touch everyone in Washington is on both sides. The Democratic Party does not want Hillary Clinton. They didn't mm. want her the first time. Yeah. They wanted economic populism. That's why Bernie Sanders, despite having the card stacked against him, got 43% of the vote right. in the Democratic primary, not because he's charming or smart. He's not. <laughs> but because... He was making an economic case that people actually cared about, mm. and they missed that message. Mm. And so even talking about Hillary Clinton, the candidate of the finance community, coming back and getting the nomination shows they learned nothing from wow. this experience. Okay, before I get to some contemporary issues, how did you select who I would didn't. be on this cover? I'm not a visual person. Okay. I'll cop to it immediately. I wrote the book, yes. every word. And you delegated the illustration. 100%. They said, and they the put Lindsey needs... Graham and uh, Mitch McConnell, which now I bet you would like to replace. Are they going to be replaced in the paperback? <laughs> You're going to draw your own <laughs> illustrations. I mean, look, I felt, the heroes of the cabinet. I felt battle. very virtuous as a cable news host writing my own book. Okay, because yeah, that, that, like, so happen, many don't. Right? You're right. 
I so write my own too. I know you do. That's why we're friends. That's why they're so bad. But, <laughs> but go ahead. Go ahead. No. I'm so, sorry. but they said we need a cover. I said just I don't know. Make it bipartisan because the case I'm making is right. Bipartisan. It's bipartisan. Lindsey Graham and who's that? The Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, Mitch McConnell of Kentucky. Is, they're not really actually discussed at great length in the book. Bill Crystal is discussed at yes. great length in the book. But I would say that Lindsey Graham's foreign policy positions are not popular with the public and have not been. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't seem to play a role in his calculations, and it should. And so Mitch McConnell, not clear why he's there. <laughs> I know if you know. <laughs> he look, he, he's very identifiable on the cover. I mean, from my perspective, Mitch McConnell is a great tactician. He understands the rules of the Senate in a way that most people don't. He's very good at his job. I don't think he's an ideologue one way or the other. Quick question for you. Uh, CNN sued Donald mm -hmm. Trump, claiming that Jim Acosta's First Amendment rights are under attack when they took away his White House hard pass because of his behavior in the East Room. Do you agree with that? Is this a violation of a journalist's First Amendment rights to take that hard pass? I agree that speech is under attack. You do, and you make that case oh, forcefully in the book. And that CNN has not only sat by as it's happened, but abetted it. CNN was the driving force be behind deplatforming Alex Jones. Mm. And the rest of us were saying, well, Alex Jones is crazy. Whatever, I don't care what Alex Jones says. Right. Alex Jones has a perspective, a large audience, and he's no longer allowed to communicate because CNN pushed his advertisers, mm. pushed the tech platforms that hosted his show to drop him. And so for CNN to be making a case for free speech is remarkable. Look, I don't think the Trump administration helps itself by making the story about Jim Acosta. Acosta yeah. is a buffoon. He's not a martyr. Mm. And so I think they should have ignored Jim Acosta. You know, shh, Jim, adults are yeah. talking, please. Take a week, you'll get your hard pass yeah, next yeah. week, which is Come what's going now. to happen. But to see CNN, which has attacked the First Amendment relentlessly for the past two years, mm. I mean, RT was just threatened, Russia Today was just threatened by the DOJ mm. with jail time its editors, if they didn't register under FARA, the Foreign Agent Registration right. Are we making BBC register? China State Television? Like, right. what is this? Anyway. Right. Irish, R RT? I Irish, exactly mm -hmm. right. We sat by in the rest of the press and allowed industry and government to squelch speech, and we said nothing, but we stand up for Jim Acosta because why? I mean, look, it's fine to stand yeah. up for Jim Acosta, but why not? How about everybody? I just don't think it's a, I don't think it's a First Amendment case at all. You, you, you have a privilege when you go into the Capitol or the White House. They decide who to grant those passes to. They can surely take them away should they decide you're not worthy. Well, so that it means that CNN. doesn't stop you from reporting. Like we're, I notice feet from CNN right now, and I yep. spent, I don't know, six or seven years of my life there. You there did. were serious people there. Where are they when Jim Acosta gets up and doesn't even ask a question, gives some dumb... Jim Acosta's dumb. That's the other problem I have with Jim Acosta. <laughs> He's just not smart. He says nothing interesting. Well, you're a racist, Mr. President. Okay, fine. What's the question, son? Yeah. Why do they allow their White House correspondent to opine from the floor yeah, of the press a conference. He's not even interesting. Okay, this is interesting. I got to share this with people. There's a, there's a comment, and it speaks to all of this, the free speech. You write... A growing percentage of the country endorses not only restrictions on the First Amendment, but also the use of extra-legal violence in the face of offensive ideas. That you, turned out to be true. Prophetic, Tucker Carlson. <laughs> I mean, here you are. Yeah. In, in the last few days, I was stunned, what was it, a week ago. I'm sitting in, in the office, and you're on the phone pacing back and forth, and I'm reading about your family, your home being surrounded yeah. by these masked thugs breaking your front door, your wife terrorized inside. What is happening? Spray painting an Antifa symbol. Yeah, uh, on your, on your driveway. Um, I mean, look, their position is really clear. You're not allowed to say things we disagree with, and if you do, we're going to try and scare you into being, we're going to terrorize your wife until you shut up. Mm. So if you're looking for a threat to speech, it's, and it's not about me, I actually hate the fact the story has to do with me, and I, I know. really hate that it has to do with my family, which is basically a political. They've got nothing to do with this. They don't work in television. Right. They're not imposing their views on anyone else, unlike me. Yeah. Um, but the message of this and many other things like this, actions like this, crimes like this, is really simple. Shut up or we'll hurt you. Right. And where is CNN? Where is CNN in the face of that? Where are any of these self-described oh. guardians of the First Amendment? While people are literally too afraid to say what they think is true for fear of being fired or hurt. It's happening all over the country, and they never ever speak up. If you don't care about Alex Jones mm -hmm. having his right to speak taken away, and again, I'm not endorsing what Alex Jones right. says. I'm not even sure what Alex Jones says. Yeah. It doesn't matter. 
If that doesn't bother you, then you can be quiet the next time the subject of the First Amendment comes up, in my mm. opinion. Do you feel as if you seem to be targeted particularly now? There was the, the Antifa folks surrounding your house, which is being investigated as a hate crime. Then there's this other story. You and your family are seated at a country club of all places, and a guy at the bar says horrible things I can't even repeat. It's a family show to your daughter, calling yep. her all manner of things. Right. And it, it got into an altercation where you and your son had to go and sort of correct this guy. Now he's suing you. Is this targeted, do you think? And do you see this cascade of events as a, 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 as a piece? Of course it is. I mean, the message is really clear. You're not allowed to disagree with us. You're not allowed to say what you think, and you're not allowed to think for yourself. It's a totalitarian impulse. I mean, I think of, mm -hmm. I've lived in Washington since 1985 around people I disagree with. I mean, I disagree with most people in D.C., 94% for Hillary in my neighborhood, right. in the city. And I wouldn't think of yelling at someone or trying to force that person to believe something he doesn't believe. That just would never enter my mind mm -hmm. because basically I'm liberal. I'm liberal in the truest sense. Yeah. I think you have a right to your own conscience. Classic liberal. Yeah. Of course. You have a right to come to your own conclusions, to have your own mind, to have your own views. And they don't feel that way. I mean, ask yourself this. You've got strong political views. Do you stay up at night thinking somewhere someone in Brooklyn disagrees with me and I have to force no. that person no, to can't. get on board? Of course not. No, you can't. In Brooklyn right now, there is someone deeply concerned that somewhere in South Alabama there's someone who's not on the same page on whatever, gay marriage, mm -hmm. abortion, and we need to force that person to get in line. Their view is an evangelical view in the strictest sense of the yep. term. They seek to evangelize by force, to change minds by force. And the average conservative just can't even conceive of that. How do you stop it? How by do, standing how up it? fearlessly. So we got hassled at home and it really wrecked the tranquility of uh, not to whine. I hate whining. No, but it's and a I'm not a victim. I'm a successful, happy person. But it, yeah, it, it had a great effect mm -hmm. on the way I feel about being at home and the way my wife feels about it and our children feel about it. And I mm -hmm. said to my wife, maybe we just leave, you know, move somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And she's like, well, no, this is our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. We've been here our whole... My wife was born in D.C. Like, mm -hmm. no, we're not leaving. Our children are born here. This is our neighborhood. These are our neighbors. And we are never leaving. Mm -hmm. And I thought, good for you. That's right. That is the answer. Yeah. I'm never going to shut up. I'm never going to obey. I'm never going to change my mind, except unless you convince me, you know, like the basics work over time. No, I'm not moving. How's mm -hmm. that? In the book, again, the real crisis here is the elites on the right and the left. How do you disentangle them? And how do the people recapture their voice, given all these challenges, including the ones you're facing directly? The truth is, I, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure. Mm -hmm. I'm just a talk show host. So from my perspective, the beginning is describing the problem accurately. This is not a tussle between conservatives and liberals, left and right, Republicans and mm -hmm. Democrats. It's way bigger than that. This is primarily an economic struggle. The main question is, how do you return the middle class to primacy in this country? Do you make this a majority middle class country with equal opportunity, economic yeah. opportunity for people? What do you do about the middle class. What, and, what about the spiritual and cultural uh, component here, which is also, I would argue, beneath the surface of, of this, course. that's what's really driving this thing. Well, what's on so a funny? Level. What's so funny? More to than me, money. When more I than was, Can I agree with that? When I was a kid, liberals used to say, you know, the most dangerous thing that could happen is the religious people take over and they'll make it a theocracy mm -hmm. and the women will have to wear cloaks <laughs> and, you know, it's going to be medieval. <laughs> and the opposite happened, of course. The country became, like, very secular and the secular mm -hmm. people took over. And what did they do? They became religious nuts. Right. Actually. They became the evangelicals. They are the religious about. nuts, completely. Mm -hmm. They see this as holy war. They see this in theological terms. When I have a policy debate, it's about policy. Right. When they have a policy debate, it's about who's going to heaven and who's going to hell, which right. they don't even believe in. But, you know, mm -hmm. who's virtuous, who's sinful, who's evil, who's good? Mm -hmm. They are the religious nuts. And so I guess my point would be all of us have the religious impulse. All of us are going to worship something. And if you think the crucifixion is ludicrous, which many people do, yeah. it's not half as ludicrous as what happens if you believe in nothing. <laughs> You're still a religious nut, but with no God, right. with no limits on your own behavior. Exactly. So I think everything goes back to that, actually. Hmm. Okay. Final quiz. I get to play. I'm ready. The, I get to play the interrogator now. Are you ready? <laughs> ready? Final quiz before we go. Name three people who will be hosting Michelle Obama as she premieres her new memoir, three celebrities who are hosting her this week.
You don't even the have to press a button. The obvious is Oprah. Oprah I mean, one. Gotta be, you got I one. Even, I would say Steve Harvey would be another. No. no. I'm so sorry. I'll give you one more. I kind of like Steve Harvey. They're all female. They're all female. One was very big in the Obama administration. Lives with the Obamas. Oh, Valerie Jarrett. Valerie Jarrett. You got two. One more, and you win. Oh, can you give me a hint? Yes, I will. Um, sex in the City. Sex, Candace Bushnell. No, she was the writer. You know of too it. much. You know, you're too literate. Oh, Sarah, from the West Village. Jessica Parker. Parker, Mrs. Matthew Broderick. That's what you were straining for. Wow, that's a pretty good call, actually. You got it. You but got Valerie it. Jarrett, that's not a good idea. Well, that's like having your roommate interview you. Tucker Carlson, <laughs> thanks right so much for being here. Good to see you. Ship of Fools, How a Selfish Ruling Class is Bringing America to the Brink of Revolution by Tucker Carlson is available now at bookstores everywhere and online. And it's a really fun read. The illustration? Eh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Tucker. Thank you. Bishop Mark Rivetuso is up next, but first some news. The big news, of course, this week, the U.S. Bishops' Conference was poised to set new accountability standards for its members in light of the sex abuse crisis swamping the church in America. However, their vote was squashed in the 11th hour by the Vatican. Officially, the Vatican communique came as a request that the U.S. bishops table a fairly tame code of conduct until after the Vatican holds its February meeting on sex abuse with bishops from around the world. Cardinal Daniel DiNardo, president of the Bishops' Conference, responded to the surprise developments on Monday this way. We have accepted with disappointment this, uh, this particular uh, event that took place this morning. We have not lessened in any of our resolve for, for actions. Um, we are going to work intensely on these uh, items of action. Announced this week, Maltese Archbishop Charles Shikluna has been appointed the adjunct secretary of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. He will head the Vatican's efforts to advance child protection. When the abuse crisis first erupted in the U.S. in 2002, the then CDF prefect, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, brought in Shikluna to work at his side as the chief prosecutor on such matters. During the next 10 years, Rome removed 3,000 clergy from ministry. But last year, Pope Francis fired the priests at the CDF prosecuting these cases and the prefect, Cardinal Gerhard Mueller. Chicluna recently investigated abuse allegations in Chile, which led to the resignation of several bishops and the laicization of Chile's most notorious abuser. Joining us for an update of what's happening at the U.S. Bishops' Fall Meeting in Baltimore is Auxiliary Bishop of St. Louis, Missouri, and member of the USCCB Committee on the Protection of Children and Young People, Bishop Mark Rivetuso. Your Excellency, thank you for joining us. It's going to be with you and your reviewing audience today. Now, Bishop, you and the bishops of Missouri issued a letter calling for decisive action at this bishop's conference, which I'm going to get to in a moment, the letter. But your reaction to Rome's decision to nix the votes on a con code of conduct and basic reporting of offending bishops? Yes. Uh, at first, I must say I was uh, taken aback, uh, a little frustrated that uh, that action was done. Uh, but after uh, a few moments of considering what the Holy Father was asking of us, I thought to myself, collective wisdom is always better than just our own wisdom. And I believe seeing the, uh, the hopeful signs of really dealing with that issue, we need the help of the Holy Father and we need to also be of service to him. The bishops of Missouri, Your Excellency, in a letter which you signed, wrote, we fear these measures will not be enough in either substance or timeliness to meet the demand that this pastoral crisis presents. Given that the bishops as a group have no canonical authority to investigate or discipline a bishop, wasn't this meeting kind of oversold from the beginning? Right. I, I, I believe that as we came together, we wanted to at least see next steps of what we could do. And I know as a body of bishops that we want to uh, remind the Holy Father and all the church, uh, especially those in the United States, that we're address we want to address this issue. We've heard our people. We're very sensitive to the victims of sexual uh, abuse by clergy. Uh, we want to be those shepherds that they're calling us to be. And I know we as a uh, province of Missouri, that we Missouri bishops wanted to make sure that 
we not only are uh, dealing with those that were going to be presented by the Conference of Bishops, but also uh, to go farther than that, to show that we really want to address and truly put the victim first. Bishop, uh, initially on your agenda at this meeting, there was that code of conduct, there was the, the reportage mechanism, how do you report uh, abuse of a bishop? But uh, in both of those areas, really, the Holy See has primacy there. Only the, the Pope can discipline or investigate a bishop. So the Apostolic Nuncio addressed the USCCB. He had this to say about bishops being in charge of policing themselves. Watch. We must show that we can solve problems rather than simply delegating them to others. Assistance is both welcome and necessary, and surely collaboration with the laity is essential. However, the responsibility as bishops of this Catholic Church is ours. So he's essentially saying the bishops will police themselves in the context of sex abuse. Does that fulfill the promise of transparency and accountability that you believe the laity is looking for? Yes. Well, I, I believe that we can fulfill, obviously, what the uh, papal nuncio has asked of us by, first of all, we're not absolving ourselves of leadership. We can't uh, turn this issue over to the laity and say, you deal with it. As a church, we need to deal with it as a church. And as leaders of the church, as uh, the shepherds, the successors of the apostles, we need to take the leadership role and we need to engage our laity because they're experts in these various areas to help us in addressing the issue, uh, helping us to address the healing that needs to be taken for victims. Bishop Rivetuso, it's clear that the Holy See, and it seems your conference has now accepted the idea that there will not be an independent lay review board overseeing allegations of bishop's abuse. A am I reading that correctly? Well, I, I know that in trying to understand the position of the uh, papal nuncio, we should respect him as a head of state, and I know that I want to uh, not put him in a place where we are going outside of not working within the church structure, but I believe that there are some things in place that we can act upon, that this is not something that goes on deaf ears by the church in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, we can work through our uh, metropolitan sees, uh, work with our archbishops, uh, work with uh, suffragans to uh, address if there are any uh, allegations against a particular bishop that it would go through the proper channels to mm -hmm. make sure that there is a process by which those who have been hurt by the church can be heard. Uh, I want to play something for you. This is the National Review Board Chair, Francesco Cesario, and he pointed out uh, that uh, the, the many in the hierarchy have yet to face consequences for their actions. Uh, listen to this. In August, Archbishop Vigano released his testimony regarding the events surrounding the abuse committed by former Cardinal McCarrick. His testimony, along with other public reports containing additional allegations and settlements, seemed to suggest that those at the highest levels of the hierarchy remain immune to the consequences of their actions that allowed abuse to occur. Archbishop Vigano's allegations must be addressed. No stone must remain unturned. Such an investigation by a lay body must be independent if its findings are to have credibility among the faithful and society in general. Your Excellency, your thoughts. Why hasn't the Holy See signed off on an apostolic investigation of McCarrick and the Vigano testimony? At least my understanding of this right now is that I know there is an investigation going on, and there are investigations going on in the diocese that uh, Archbishop McCarrick served, as well as uh, we have heard that the Vatican is also doing their preliminary investigations as well. So I believe that in going forward, we have to work together with getting all that information of where the accountability needs to, uh, to where the rubber needs to hit the road and address who has been accountable for uh, not addressing uh, the scandalous uh, misconduct of Archbishop Mer McCarrick, as well as mm -hmm. uh, those who need to be uh, obviously uh, 
dealt with through the Holy See. Yeah, Bishop, you and the bishops of Missouri are calling for, quote, the immediate acceptance of resignations from all hierarchs who voluntarily resign because of their complicit action or inaction in the Archbishop McCarrick scandal. Now, why have we seen no bishops come forward? And how do we advance here, given the intransigence coming from Rome on this issue? It seems like they just don't want to talk about it. Right. I, I really believe that at the heart of this is our credibility as bishops that we need to show to the faithful that we are taking this seriously, that oh. we are truly uh, putting the victim first, that we want to be about the healing process, and we want to be about the church's mission of doing what's right and just and what the Lord asks of us as shepherds of his church. But how do you and do that, Bishop? When, I believe when, that it's important yeah, to how, show that. How does that happen? Well, I, I really believe that, right, and I, I think that we need to, in the midst of our consensus of our meetings today, uh, to come up with a statement to the Holy Father and, and to the uh, Synod to show that this is what we are asking for greater accountability as well as, as our own body of bishops that we need to, uh, to try to be more credible in the uh, eyes of the faithful. Yeah, well, the question is, how, how does that happen? And this is, this is the frustration that, frankly, I'm feeling, the laity are feeling, right. and I know many of you are feeling as well, because, yeah. they, they, you know, right. you really can't do anything without yes. Roman involvement. That's the bottom line here. Uh, I want to play two bites for you. Perhaps we'll get further here. Right. These touch on potential ongoing abuse, not only of children, but of adults by bishops. Now, this is Bishop Daly and then Anita Raines, who's on your National Advisory Council. Listen. In discussions with lay people, very faithful lay people, who would not be on left or right as in ecclesiologies, wondered, um, did this come to be because we have certain uh, bishops or priests who don't see anything wrong with anything, uh, consensual sex between adults? It might be they themselves were compromised. The NAC unanimously and strongly calls for an audit of U.S. seminaries to investigate possible patterns of abuse of power and predatory homosexual behavior. Your Excellency, is there an issue, and you're on this committee of child protection and abuse, is there an issue with abuse of power sure. and predatory homosexual behavior in seminaries? You know, I, I really believe that in our own seminaries now, we have tremendous uh, human formation. And I really believe that that issue is being addressed as well as others to make sure we're uh, having priests who are healthy and holy. Uh, and we want to form the best priests priest possible. And I really believe the seminaries are addressing that issue. Would you support an audit, Bishop, of all the seminaries in the U.S. to make sure this predatory behavior isn't going on? Right. Well, I would support that. If, if obviously the uh, accreditation boards for seminaries, they should have this as a uh, component to make sure they're addressing. If it's a concern of the faithful, I want to make sure the faithful are uh, assured that we are addressing all concerns that they are best formed and we want them to be the best priest. Bishop Cordelione pointed out how important it is to listen to uh, experts on these matters and how he recently featured listening sessions in his diocese and he was made aware of a study. Listen. I'm sure you're all aware of the study by Father Paul Sullins that got a lot of uh, attention uh, recently where he found a near 100% of correlation between an increase of homosexual clergy and an increase in sex abuse of minors. I think the worst thing we could do is uh, discredit this study so we don't have to deal with it or ignore or deny this reality altogether. We don't know why there's a correlation between an increased rate of homosexual clergy and an increased rate of sexual abuse of minors. So this study would simply take the causes and context study to a deeper level. And this is something we can do now. We didn't need anyone's authorization to commission that study, and we don't need anyone's authorization to commission this one. Cordelione's intervention was met with applause. Would you support that, and were you surprised by the finding of this report he cited? Well, I, I, I will say that um, I really believe if there is a correlation, obviously, if, if these studies are showing that, uh, we need to address it. That that's why I said before about the formation not only of our seminarians but also that we have the integrity as priests and bishops to live this out as well that we're witnessing as well as teaching what the church is asking of us for greater 
Christian morals to be lived in the lives of all of us as well as the faithful. There's been a real cry from the laity, I don't have to tell you, um, throughout the church, even many bishops, not to remain silent on this issue. I want to play what Bishop Van of Orange County had to say, and he really is taking this quite personally. Listen. I came from a diocese that was damaged, greatly damaged, for 16 years and beyond by the predatory behavior of the diocesan bishop. I lived through that. So did my mom and dad. Nobody knew what to do. Their cries seemed to go unheard, and that woundedness and the evil that came from that persists to this day. So this is very personal for me. So we have to really give a clear response to this, how important this is for us as bishops of the United States, so we can make our voice heard and there be no silence. Your Excellency, you serve on the USCCB Committee for the Protection of Children and Young People. What do you want to see Rome do in February, and how do you break this silence? We're dealing with people who are broken, who are hurt, who have been betrayed uh, by the church, by uh, and hurt, wounded in a relationship with God because of ministers who broke their sacred trust and who they were called to be for those uh, minors, Christ himself. And I know that we do not want to silence healing that needs to take place. And I really believe that what I'm hoping for in February is that we're coming together as a church saying that we want to be Christ in the church. We want to be Christ for those who are hurting, those who are suffering, those who are afflicted. And we can't have the silence. The silence has not served any purpose at all. We have to be people who have a voice and we have to be people who bring a greater awareness of this issue because it goes beyond the church to society itself. Your Excellency, I, I can't recall anywhere in the scriptures Christ acting so slowly or being so silent in the face of hurting and grave evil like this. I mean, the fact that McCarrick remains a, a, an archbishop today, he's still exercising functions as a priest, is pretty astounding. I mean, that, that astounds me, just as a member of the laity. Uh, any worries that by February, and then I'll let you go, any worries that by February moral credibility will sure. be lost by waiting this length of time, seven months, eight months, nine months since this, this PA report came out, and that by that time, in February, the AG reports will start landing and swamp whatever Rome does? Uh, I know one thing. When we heard about the uh, postponing of votes uh, regarding this matter, we had to remember our, uh, that even though we are faithful and respectful to the Holy Father, uh, we will indeed enter into that synod with wanting to listen to him as well as uh, enter into dialogue with uh, the other representatives of the Episcopal conferences. Mm -hmm. But we said to ourselves, we cannot stand still on this. We can't be halted in our efforts what Jesus has asked of us. And we, when we go back to our diocese, I want to be held accountable and transparent to our own faithful that we're entrusted to serve with Christ's pastoral care, and we need to have our own next steps. Very good. Bishop Mark Rivetuso, thanks for your time, and we share your, your hope that uh, something good will come from February. Thank you. And now it's time to get story-ended. He's a National Book Award-nominated author and illustrator of books for children. His latest is a very personal graphic novel about growing up in a family grappling with addiction. Hey, kiddo details his experience. I sat down with him recently to talk about his life, the important new book, and great stories, and also what it's like to be nominated for the National Book Award. Here's my exclusive interview with Jarrett Krososka. Jarrett, I've got to start with kind of the wide angle here. This is your 38th book. Number did, 38, yes. Did you always want to be a storyteller? I always wanted to be a storyteller. I always... I always loved to draw, as a, as a kid I did, mm -hmm. and it wasn't until I was an adult when I looked back at all the drawings I had made, mm -hmm. all of those drawings were made to tell stories, to tell mm -hmm. stories via comics or short little stories yeah. with words and pictures together. But this is really the first time that you, and this, this was a long time coming, hey kiddo, uh, it really is such a heartfelt memoir in many ways of those early years. Why did you decide, first of all, this is not for every reader. It's not for your normal audience of very young readers. It's 12 and up. Yes. Why was now the time to tell this story? And why did you decide to tell it in the voice of the 17-year-old Jared? Sure. I love coming-of-age stories, that moment in a young person's life when they are deciding who they want to become. 
and, and what they want to do with their lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not that, you know, that when, you, when you ask why now, yeah. it's more the question of like, you know, why did it take you so long? Because I'd been working on it for several years. I'd been thinking about it. You wanted um, to do this in your early 20s. I did, and every time I sat down to write the book, I would stop and sort of censor myself because I would fear what people would think on mm. how I was representing what happened. Mm. And, I, and I realized pretty quickly that if I, were to, if I wanted to write this book, yeah. a story about my upbringing, it needed to be authentic, and if I wasn't emotionally ready for the consequences mm. of putting this book out in the world, I shouldn't write it. Your, your editor, I read in an interview, your editor, when he got the first manuscript of this, said, you're dodging the heart of this story. I was what dodging. What were you dodging? Stuff. Well, you know, by the time I, I finally gained the courage to write this book, my mother wasn't in the first draft much mm. at all. And my editor, David Levithan, pointed that out. And, and he's also, not only is my editor... A good friend of yours. And a good friend of mine and a, a very talented author. And he, uh, he said, you're avoiding writing about your mother. Mm. You know, and so I gave him several scenes and went digging. And the, the thing about writing about your own life, I mean, we have our memories. Right. And they, they exist in the, the deepest parts of our brains. But then you, you might talk to a relative and you might remember something. I also activated all of my various senses to trigger memory. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, your, your sense of smell is, is the most powerful sense to uh, take your back, back memory. So I, I, I went out and bought my grandmother's perfume and my grandfather's aftershave. Wow. And even the sense of touch. So I went on eBay and bought some of the old toys that I had had. So I, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a moment in the story where, I'm, where I'm, I'm very young and I'm given a tan Tonka truck. Mm -hmm. and so I looked up online to see what it looked like. But I wanted to remember what it felt like. Huh. So I ordered it. And, you know, this is not like the, the trucks. My, my kid has a truck made of locally sourced recycled plastic. Right. right? <laughs> this, this was made of, of lead paint right. and yeah. steel. <laughs> yeah. And it just, and, uh, and the, uh, you know, your, your sense of hearing. So I, I had a playlist of music my grandparents would listen to, wow. that I listened to when I was young. And, and, and activating all of those senses helped me dig deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Mm. Well, it's, it's such a personal and difficult portrait at times. Your mother was addicted to opium use. When did you know that she was an addict? How early did you know? I was in, in, in fourth grade, and uh, so my, my grandparents took me in just before I turned three. Mm -hmm. So now there I was, uh, I probably had just turned 10 years old, mm -hmm. and they sat me down, and they said, well, we think it's time that you know the truth as to why you're, why you're here. And this scene your is in the is. book. And that, scene is, that scene is in the book, and oh. I... Uh, I have a very uh, uh, strong memories of that, of that event because it was traumatic. Mm -hmm. And traumatic events tend to stay with us very vividly. Yeah. And he, he sat me down on the couch and just told me straight, you know, she's, she's addicted to drugs and uh, she's been incarcerated and that's why you haven't seen her. Mm. And so every now and then, you know, maybe I would visit her in a halfway home. My grandfather never took me to see her in prison. He didn't want me to see that aspect. And of she her was life. in and out of prison throughout. She was in and out of prison. She was in and out of halfway homes and uh, recovery mm. recovery places. Um, and as a, as a and so that was difficult to take in. Now, especially growing up in the 1980s, where there was this one public service announcement that really stuck out to me. And mm. and and most people who grew up in the 80s remember this, where yeah. uh, the father comes into the teenager's room and he's found found a box of drugs, mm -hmm. and he says to the kid, "Who taught you how to use this stuff?" And very famously, the boy says, you, all right, I learned it by watching you. Mm. And then the narrator came, comes on and says, parents who use drugs have children who use drugs. Now, as an adult, I'm thinking, why were they playing that during Saturday morning cartoons? Right, why are they telling <laughs> they, us that? They should have just playing that during the evening news right. when the parents were watching it. Right. And so I was so fearful that, oh, no, am I doomed I'm to gonna follow be a drug that same oh, suit? Wow. Am I going to be a drug addict as well? Mm. Uh, and so my, my mother, you know, while she was incarcerated, she would write me letters, but she would also, more importantly, draw me pictures. She would draw a cartoon of, say, Snoopy, and then I would write her back, and I would draw her a picture of Garfield. So we mm. traded these drawings back and forth. So, you know, at, at, at fourth, fifth, sixth grade, I'm seeing how talented she is wow. and that I was, you know, given that same talent and she was never able to do anything with it. So I was determined at a very young age to like, you know what, I'm going all in. Mm -hmm. This is what I want to do, full stop. Wow. Do, do you believe, uh, you surely do, that the roots of your talent, your, your drawing ability, came from your mother? Oh, it came from my mother, which in turn came from my grandfather, her, her dad, the, the wow. grandfather who raised yeah. Joe. Yeah. Tell me about Joe and Cheryl. Now, they are in the middle of this terrible, the trauma of having a parent who is opioid addicted and addicted to drugs and in and out of prison. 
You have this amazing story that you've captured of Joe and Cheryl, your grandparents. And I can imagine from traveling around the country as you do and talking to kids in schools, this is not a unique situation yes. in today's America. Tell me about them and what it's taught you telling their story and that interaction of the young, younger generation and their grandparents. So growing up, they always shared stories about what it was like growing up in the Great Depression, mm. what it was like to get ice for a literal icebox, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, how hard they worked, and my grandfather, you know, how he started his first job. And so the, the chapter one opens with the two of them meeting in high school. Because I realized to tell my story, I need to tell my mother's story. Mm. To tell my mother's story, I need to tell her parents' story. Mm. And so I was able to pull these stories that they had told me over the years and you know, put them down in print and have them there for, to share with people. Mm -hmm. His hard work, his, his service in the Navy during World War II. Um, they, were, they were very uh, salty characters. You know, they, they <laughs> cursed like a truck driver who used to be a sailor. <laughs> they smoked two packs a day each, non-filters. Wow. Uh, you know, and it was constantly, uh, there's constantly cigarette. You know, with, when you're writing children's books, you know, make sure everyone's wearing a helmet. Right. Everyone's wearing a seatbelt. <laughs> no cigarettes. No cigarettes. And, and with, no with, cursing. No cursing. <laughs> and with, with, to write this book authentically, yeah. grandparents don't have seatbelts. Yeah. There's not enough cigarettes. <laughs> there's booze. In, there's, there's, there's booze. There's, there's booze in the evening. You know, because they were, they were never labeled as alcoholics. Right. But by the time I was in fourth, fifth grade, I could order their drinks. Southern Comfort mm -hmm. Manhattan Dry with a twist, rocks on the side. Mm -hmm. So the ice on the side, so that glass could be as full as, as possible. possible. And they would have two or three of those at dinner when wow. we were out, you know, for dinner on a Friday night. Wow. wow. Yeah. And, but, you know, the thing is, is, though, my mother and my grandparents, as crazy as life was, I was loved. Yeah. I had unconditional love. And that love. shines through in this narrative. I'm and so I happy to love that. that. The, the brokenness, I, the reason this works, and you know this, and the audience, I think, knows it when they encounter truth, it's unfiltered. Like, the, like their cigarettes, like the cigarettes, it's unfiltered. unfiltered yeah. <laughs> and people know he's presenting these people in all their flaws, and their love inevitably breaks through. Yeah. And I, I, it, that's what struck me. I know these people. They didn't live in Worcester. They were in New Orleans. But it's the same people, the yeah. same understanding, the same... Uh, life choices and at times difficult lives that they yeah. that they fought and to carry that affection for you which they took to the very end I want to ask this question it's a curious choice for an author to open a book with his grandfather teaching him to drive in a cemetery yes well again it's truth that's where I was taught how to drive so but why that open why in a cemetery why start the book why start the at book a place in a cemetery uh, well of death one it's an, uh, you know as as sort of dark as a cemetery can be, it also offers a moment of levity mm -hmm. because it's an everyday thing that my grandfather is teaching us to drive in, a, teaching me and all of his kids to drive in a cemetery because everybody's already dead. Mm -hmm. You know, and that was his humor. <laughs> he had a dark sense of humor. You know, when, when he talked about where he and his wife, my grandmother, were going to be buried someday, yeah. he's like, you know, put me, on the, put me on the corner so like I can sneak out at night and she won't <laughs> know I'm gone. You know? And, uh, and so I, because I'm talking about family, I'm talking about family history. Mm -hmm. He would always stop by and see his parents' grave. So I was able to, to make a connection with my great-grandparents yeah. and where they, where they are and were, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I wanted to cement, so you said, why, you also asked earlier, why did I tell this story from a 17-year-old perspective? Right. Because I need to be on the side of my reader. Mm. And my reader is the, the teenager the for this book. Uh, when, while I was working on this book, I also was writing a picture book. It's called Naptastrophe. Inspired by my daughter, Lucy, who doesn't like to nap. And if wow. she doesn't nap, as you know, a toddler has a naptastrophe. Free and the first draft was all about why naps are important. Mm. And this is why, this is what you should, you have to take a nap because it's terrible if you don't. And I thought, you know what? I'm not on the side of the parent. I'm on the side of the, the reader uh -huh. here. I'm on the side of that, that four-year-old. And for the four-year-old, naps take you out of your day. Uh -huh. You know, you're not playing with your toys. So I had to be there for that 17-year-old kid. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to cement this story as being told by the 17-year-old. And then we go all the way back uh, to the early 1940s. Mm. My grandparents meet in high school. He leaves for the service. They start their family. And my grandmother starts drinking very heavily. And then you see where things are going to go haywire with my mother. Mm -hmm. And I also, I wanted to give my mother 
uh, I wanted readers to have empathy for my mother. I didn't want it to be, because life isn't black and white. Mm -hmm. Life is varying shades of gray, and it's a, it's a sliding scale of complicated for everybody. Yeah. And when we see people on the streets, uh, you know, perhaps they're homeless, perhaps they're strung out, and it might be really easy to just label them a junkie, mm -hmm. but that's somebody's kid. Mm -hmm. That might be somebody's parent. Right. Could be somebody's sibling. They're mm -hmm. somebody's family. Mm -hmm. So before you see Leslie go really dark down this path with her heroin addiction, mm -hmm. you see her as a sad kid. Yeah. You see her as a lost teenager. Mm -hmm. you, you, the chapter dealing with the early part of your childhood, you call it not life with mother, but life with Leslie. Life with Leslie, yeah. Why that distance? Um, there, was, there was a time in my life when, uh, and you know, the majority of my teen and adult life, where I would call her Leslie. You know, because the moniker of, of mom, I felt belonged to my grandmother because mm. she had raised me. Uh, also, uh, it's alliterative, you know, yeah. two words start with the same Leslie. sound, life with Leslie makes it, it's it. But, pretty. But um, that is something where my editor David pointed out to me that he and I were talking on the phone yeah. about that first draft. Yeah. And he said, you barely talk about your mother. Mm. And I replied, I guess passive aggressively, Yes, I didn't write about Leslie all that much. Mm. And he, caught, he picked that up mm -hmm. to say, I, okay, that, to, that told me a lot. Your reply there told me a lot. Mm. And that got you to go back and go deeper. Go deeper and, and find story. more stories to share. I, I want to go back to one quick thing. That eternal perspective, to my eye when I read the book, that eternal perspective, that sense that your grandparents, because of where they were in life, yeah. and the cemetery <laughs> being... You know, they know that's my, my father always goes, you know, I, I went by my retirement home today. Oh, you know, he yeah, goes yeah, to the cemetery. Yeah, yeah. Um, th that sense of eternity's coming and yeah. eternity's with us. How did that color your childhood and how does it affect your work today and this work in particular? Yeah, when you're being raised by your grandparents, I mean, they, I can understand as a parent, you want nothing more but for your children to, to grow up to be adjusted adults who can take care of themselves right. you are no longer able to take care of them. Mm -hmm. Now I can only imagine for my grandparents now, they are in their 60s mm -hmm. taking care of this young child. They just have a sense that their, their time uh, is, that they're closer to death than they are to birth, for right. sure. Um, so any, you know, anytime my grandmother would take a photo, she'd say, if that comes out good, put it in the paper. <laughs> you know, so that way her friends could see a flattering photo of her. I love it you whenever know. you quote them. Oh, you, you always have to. put the cigarette. You have to put the cigarette, yeah. the cigarette in your <laughs> yeah. mouth. You have I have to. a friend who I always do because I always see them with the cigarette. Um, d d tell, me, tell me about the. You have your, your grandfather kneeling by his parents' grave at the beginning of the oh. book. There is this, at times, saucy sense of faith where they're, you know, throwing yeah. out the expletives. At other times, there's a sense of faith lingering around these scenes. Yeah. How much did that figure in the life of your grandparents in your own life, getting yeah. through this? My, my grandfather was Catholic. Mm -hmm. My grandmother was Protestant. Wow. Uh, but they, they raised us all in the Catholic Church. Hmm. And uh, so he, he brought us to church and made sure we all went and to the sacraments. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, another funny story about my yeah. grandmother that's not in this book, uh, which you'll appreciate. So a friend and I, uh, we traveled to Italy, and I went to the Vatican, and I, and I bought these, uh, you know, these rosaries, these wooden rosaries that were, were blessed by the Pope, okay. and I brought them home to my grandmother. <laughs> And okay. she was reading her trashy, you know, romance novel. <laughs> and she said, oh, thanks, Josh. She was like, but you know, you know, you know I'm not Catholic, right? And I said, yeah, I know. You're Protestant. She goes, okay. She goes, you know what? When I die, put them in my hands. That way when all my friends come through, they'll be like, wasn't, wasn't she Protestant? <laughs> She's and hedging that her, is what we did. Hedging yes. her bets. Yes. There, right? yeah. She's hedging her bets. Yeah. Now, you don't meet your father until you're 17. I'm 17. Yeah. He sends you notes. He sends you a letter. Finally sends you a picture of his sibling. He sent me a letter uh, when uh, I was 16 and a half. Mm. And then I, I took some time before I, I wrote him back. And I wrote him back because I thought to myself, you know, I, at that point, I, I want nothing to do with this guy. But he might have had other kids. And I'll never know if I have siblings out there mm. unless I swallow my pride. And engage. And, and, and engage. Mm. Yeah. And you did. And I did. And you have a relationship and now. And he's still in my life now, as are my brother and sister. Wow. Yeah. You wrote a piece in the Washington Post recently, and you talked about, you wrestled with coming from Lunch Lady and the amazing, fun, whimsical, silly books you've written that my children and others adore. Now you're getting into subject matter that is more real more gritty, 
and you, you wrestled with what's appropriate for kids at different ages. And you discussed this book, Hey Kiddo, with your own daughter. Yes. She's what? She's nine. Nine? Almost, almost ten. And her reaction, there's a particular story in the book you tell of your mother who was involved, one of her boyfriends was involved in a murder. Yes. She disposes of the murder weapon. Yes. And you all had this discussion. What did your yes. daughter say in reaction? And as you can imagine, a lot of things that I need to approach with my kids about their family history. Mm. So I want to make sure we had that conversation before, before the world read about it in the book. <laughs> and I think as parents, too, we were nervous to talk to our kids about difficult things. Mm. And I think those nerves, we have to realize that's on us because our kids are able to handle these, these, mm -hmm. these things and these truths, these complicated, difficult truths. And so she was very quick to point out that you know, maybe she helped him because she was nervous if he was a violent man. Mm. He would have hurt her. Mm. He, maybe he would have hurt you as a baby. So she, she took that news, and instead of saying, oh, what a terrible what person. A terrible person mm. Well, let's think about what she was going through. Let's think about how scared she, how was. Scared she was in that mm. moment. And that's something that I hadn't even thought of. The empathy of children. The empathy of they children are, is They are profound. inherently empath empathetic. And we just need to give them credit for that. You know, and, and it's interesting, you know, we talk about these difficult subjects, and I, I did write that Washington Post op-ed about yeah. when do we give kids these sort of information. Mm -hmm. So I was, at a, I was at a book signing recently, and there was a mother there with an eight-year-old. And in, in, my, in my internal monologue here, I thought, oh, gosh, like, sh sh does she think this is the Lunch Lady show or mm. Jedi Academy? Or, yeah. And I thought, you know what? I don't say anything. Let them. They'll get it. Right. There's, there's a slide with this book. If they need to leave, they'll leave. Right. And uh, at, the, at the book signing after the presentation, that mother told me that uh, that, that girl's 12-year-old brother died of an overdose. Oh, boy. So we have these difficult things. Mm. that we're worried about telling kids, but meanwhile, these kids are living the difficult truth. Yeah, I mean, I read, it might have been in your article, 8.7 million children, 17 and under, yeah. are living with... In some homes, sort of addiction. Yeah, where there's yeah. some sort of addiction there at play. That's a huge number. Huge and you number. see it, don't you see it in the school visits, though? You, yes. In between, they'll come and tell you, you know, this reminded yeah. me, even when you're doing whimsical work, you know, I, I, they oh, come absolutely. up to me and say, uh, you know, that, that demon you talk about in the book, when Will was fighting that, I felt like I was fighting my dad when he's on drugs. I'm like, yeah. whoa. Yeah. You don't realize the pain that's in many of these classrooms that these children are carrying with them. What has been the reaction to this, Jared, as that's kids read it and absorb it? What are they telling you? I'm hearing stories of kids saying, I thought I was the only one. Mm. You know, um, I was just at a book signing here in D.C., and uh, I... A young student, 14, 15 years old, gave me a fist bump and said, "I'm a part of the No Dads Club, too." Oh, and uh, and and, and it's uh, you know books can be could be mirrors and windows, mm -hmm. so we we see ourselves reflected or we can see our, into the lives of others, and 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 I'm grateful that that's what this book is doing for people. Your mother died in March of 2017. She did. You shared with her though that you were working on this. Yes. Um, tell me what the last meeting with her was like. It was, I know. A, it was in a cemetery. Uh, you yes. see? <laughs> full circle here. It was full circle. So about a year after she passed, uh, her, her eldest brother died. And uh, the last time I saw her was at, uh, at, at his burial. Hmm. Now, I, was I, was, I had suspected that my mother was using again. She was getting arrested again. You know, for some time, the only way I could keep track of her was to look up her last name uh, on the court records. So the last, our last interaction was she said, I, I love you. And I always will. And I said, I love you and I always will. Mm. And, and I was getting to the point where I thought, okay, now that I have some stuff to share about this book, I need to talk to her to see what her comfort level is on what I'm sharing. Because this is her life as well. Mm. Uh, you know, and, and then you know, she died and she, she left me uh, with her stories. Mm. You know, she didn't leave me with any kind of physical material and I don't need any of that mm. I the love she gave me is, is still carries me to this day it's I I'm so appreciative for that love her life story my grandparents life story that uh, she and she always hoped that her story might be able to help other people suffering from mm. addiction you know uh, and and when she died and she died of a heroin overdose that really taught me like wow she could not help herself you know God yeah. bless her yeah no I, I it's an empathetic portrait of her it's a true portrait of the effect this addiction has on not only the child, but everyone around that child. Yeah. And I think for children who are going through this, 
or kids who might be contemplating or entering the possibility of drug use, which let's admit, it's in schools and on streets all over this country. And it starts young. It's a cautionary tale. She oh. started at what, 13? 13. Yeah. And that's where some people would say, well, I, you know, this book says 12 and up, but I would probably wait until 14. Until 15 or 18. And I said, well, my mother started using when she was 13. Mm -hmm. No, it's a, timely, yeah. it's a timely age. And this book is for 12 and up. But given the younger and younger age of children addicted that I see today, yeah. uh, and friends of mine on police forces will tell you, I, I think it's an important book for 12 and up. They, yeah. it's, and and it's, it's not only an engaging, fun tale and a true one, but because there are light moments here and a lot of yeah. and true fun <laughs> moments as well. Give me a sense of the importance of silly books. And that is what you made your name oh, doing. Silly it's books why people so love you. Yeah. Platypus Police Force, The Lunch Lady, Jedi Academy. What is the importance of silly books in the lives of children and, and in their parents? Well, silly books offer uh, something high interest for the kid to read. Mm -hmm. Silly Books offers a reprieve, a possible escape portal. Right. You know, I had kids coming up to me talking about, you know, the Lunch Lady books made them want to read. Now this is, I, all I wanted to do was draw a Lunch Lady fighting off robots with fish stick nunchucks. <laughs> and, and ex, you know, using food words as expletives, right? And, and so many people have said to me, these books got their kids reading, but also some people would say, you know, my, my kid was dealing with trauma. I, I left an abusive relationship. Mm. My kid started really slipping. She couldn't latch onto anything, but she had these lunch lady books. And I think back to my childhood, yeah. well, I read Garfield and, you know, Calvin and Hobbes and, and, and Snoopy and all of these comic strips. Yeah. I'd go to the comic book store once a month to look for the latest Batman or Spider-Man or X-Men. Mm. And those were my, my lifeboats. Those were my life Your jackets. Lifelines. You know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what do you think it is about children in difficult circumstances and the power of literature? My friend Dean Koontz, of course, best-selling author, his childhood books were his refuge. He had an abusive father. Mm -hmm. um, and the books became his salvation yeah. and his life's work. Is there something there where kids in difficult situations almost need um, this kind of imaginative life craft that then they, yeah. they take into their adulthood? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I, I just happen to go into a creative endeavor. Right. No matter what you do as an adult, silly books are important. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. no, no matter what your line of work is going to be, because reading is important, because reading will develop empathy. Reading will help you have a deeper understanding of yourself. Um, and joy. And, the importance and joy. of joy, and which joy. we are losing, not only yeah. in society, but for our kids, too. Yes. It's important to give them a sense of joy. There are a few books I read, particularly graphic novels. I'm not a big graphic novel guy. I loved comic books when I was younger. I'm not a big graphic novel guy. This one is so moving and beautiful. Why the orange? We didn't ask. Why the gray and rust palette oh, okay. throughout the book, which is important? It is important. So I wanted it to be limited color because I didn't like graphic memoirs are very popular in the middle grade market, which is like seven to 11 year right. olds. And I wanted to go limited palette to signal that this was for, for older readers. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, the gray skills because I mentioned earlier, life is varying shades of gray. Mm -hmm. And it's that orange. So my grandfather always would rock a pocket square. So he'd always, when he was getting dressed up, he'd always put in a pocket square. An orange one? Orange or red. Wow. And he'd always put in a pop of color. A pop of color. Pop of color. And so uh, <laughs> when he died and we were donating his clothes to charity, I couldn't get myself to donate these pocket squares because they were so him. Mm. My daughter Zoe, who was then one and a half, toddled over, took this silk pocket square, put it to her cheek, oh. and said, mine, and it became her security blanket. Oh. And she slept with it every night since then. She'll be 10 in December. Wow. So that orange is that very color orange. Amazing. No, there's so many beautiful touches. The, the pineapple wallpaper, so much here that's evocative and powerful. When I first read it, I said, wow. You know, you can feel the... Um, authenticity. You Even almost smell the, the cigarette smoke. Yeah, almost so, smell um, the cigarette. Yeah. And I smell the JV. Or, or, the, or the aftershave or the yeah, shell. It's or, there. It's <laughs> there in the ether. Jared, congratulations. Thank, Thank you, you for Raymond. being here. Love the book. Hey, Thank kiddo, you. it's in bookstores everywhere. Thank you. <laughs> that is all the time we have for now. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook. You can follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. And get ready for book three of the Will Wilder series coming in February. The first two Will Wilder books are in bookstores everywhere. They will make great Christmas gifts and prepare everybody for the upcoming sequel. They're available at the EWTN Religious Catalog and at bookstores everywhere. Be sure to join us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen.
On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thanks for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.